I want you to imagine you had a time machine, but it's a very particular kind of time machine. The time machine has a knob, and on it are things like went to public school, moved to Dayton, never drank alcohol, didn't play baseball, did gymnastics instead. Each point on the knob is a change from what you did in the past, and when you press the green button, you're transported to the alternate reality where you've done things a bit differently. But how much different would your life actually be? Some of these points on the knobs are long-term habit changes. I imagine, for instance, that my life would have been worse if I didn't start lifting weights, probably better if I'd traveled more. If I'd majored in computer science, I certainly would not be in Dayton, Ohio. But some of these points are not habits. Instead, they're discrete decisions. What if I'd chosen the job in Shinju instead of Taipei? I would never have learned debate or taught debate, and debate track would never have existed. Same if I hadn't randomly searched on Craigslist for a job, or if any of the 30 schools I'd walked into cold in my first few days in Taiwan had given me a better offer. On a broader scope, historians love the global version of this magical time machine. They love to imagine what would have happened if Alexander the Great hadn't died at 32, or what our world would be like if the nuclear bomb had never been invented, or how the USSR would be today if not for its fall. But of course, we'll never really have this time machine. The present moment, at this moment, erases these choices and distills possibilities down to a single, concrete outcome. The job of debate, in part, is to use our skills as humans, our innate future-emulating skills, to create the time machine ahead of the churning singularity of the present. Unlike romanticizing about what would have happened if I'd stayed with my high school sweetheart, a singular, romantic, and very fake image in my head, the actual potentialities of the future splinter at every new fact introduced. Uniqueness in debate plays an essential role in combating our wild imaginations. If our policy passes or doesn't pass, maybe the world wouldn't change that much. The magical time knobs of affirmative and negative can converge, actually, over large swaths of the future. Maybe the Alexandrian Empire wouldn't would be alive today, and maybe Alex would have just died at 33 instead of 32. Maybe we'd be on World War 17 already, but maybe large-scale conventional threats would have played the same role as the bomb. Maybe the Cold War would be entering its 76th year. And maybe the Americans and Soviets would be friends. And maybe we'd all be Soviets. The point is, when it comes to the future, every small fact can matter. And at the same time, with a thousand variables to consider, we're almost guaranteed to be wrong. Today's topic will make good use of our imaginary time knob. Many possible worlds lay ahead of us. Welcome to March 2023, India and the Artemis Accords. First, let's try dispensing with pro and con, shall we? Everyone else has. Now it's my turn. Long live af and neg. All evidence quoted or misquoted, remember I'm reading quotes based on highlighting, not reading them verbatim. All evidence quoted in this lecture can be found on our website at debatetrack.com for $10 a month. Your membership fee goes to keeping these lectures free for the debate community. Coaching is also available for long-term classes of 12 students or more. Free practice rounds were also available, but we're not doing that anymore because only three of you signed up. Instead, I highly encourage you to sign up for something better, a tournament with cash prizes, the North American Debate Circuit's Aquamarine Cup, March 24th and 25th, on this topic. I truly believe that if there's a bright future for a public forum, it lies with NADC. This is the early days of Apple. Buy some stock. Compete. I've included a link in the description. Now, on to the resolution. March 2023, resolved. The Republic of India should ratify the Artemis Accords. This resolution is short and simple. There's really not much room for interpretation here. The Republic of India is just India. We'll spend the rest of the lecture talking about the Artemis Accords, so 
You'll get all the definition you need on that. But how about this term, ratify? Signing a contract or a treaty or a resolution means a representative party has agreed to the spirit of the document. They're saying, yeah, I think this looks good. Depending on the governing body, this may or may not be legally binding. Ratification, on the other hand, is more serious. It means the country or party, in this case, India, fully accepts the terms. This act is legally binding. By analogy, imagine you're rich enough to have a butler, a helper, uh, some of you may be. Your family is on vacation in Mauritius. While you're gone, your helper signs a contract to put a new roof on the house. It's not your signature, it's not really binding to you, but definitely shows to the roofing company that your intentions are solid. When you get back home, you can discuss the terms with the company and ratify a proper contract. That is the idea, sign versus ratify. I'm not a lawyer, I don't know if that would actually work, but seemed like a helpful analogy. That's the resolution. Next, the major space players. If you haven't been clued in already, this topic is about space. We'll start by briefly touching on six major space firing countries. I'll present them as two blocks, the US Europe block and the Russia China block. Despite practical, technological, and economic considerations, the fact is this is how the two sides will break down. Dr. Ch Chaitanya Giri was the fellow of Space and Ocean Studies program at Gateway House and has an otherwise incredible resume, a few cards and the evidence from him. He summarizes this divide here. Please pay attention to this. Quote, more than 20 nations have established space agencies in the last 20 years, creating geopolitical block equivalents in space that can be called astropolitical blocks. United States, Russia, Europe, and China currently possess high-end capabilities, from human space flight to planetary surface exploration to space-based astronomy. Hence, they fit into the category of Echelon 1 space firing nations. Each of them wants to accommodate a band of Echelon 2 and Echelon 3 nations under their respective astropolitical blocks. Historically, India has been amongst the few nations with the unique ability to engage in space diplom diplomacy with Europe, Russia, and the US, all Echelon 1 nations. India's ability to uphold its strategic autonomy will depend on its ability to master space diplomacy. It must begin to prepare for mastery." End quote. Here's a brief breakdown of these Echelon 1 space programs along with India. Uh, budget numbers come from Statista and include both government and private spending. The U.S. is the largest space industry, with $62 billion spent on space-related activities in 2022, including a massive $24 billion NASA budget. You'll notice a large delta here between the industry and the NASA budget, $38 billion. The U.S.'s main strength likely comes from nurturing of private space industry. The top 10 private space companies in the world are all from the US, including Boeing, SpaceX, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, and Northrop Grumman. And of course, the US is the only country to have landed men <coughs> on the moon. Not incidentally, the Artemis Accords uh, and program are works of the US government. Next, European Space Agency. The ESA consists of 22 European member nations, including several that have signed the Artemis Accords, like France, Italy, and Poland, and some that have not, like Germany and the Netherlands. While no single European country can compete with the US in space, 22 countries do, together, pack quite a punch, especially with their focus on technology, science, and European-focused satellites. Next, Japan. JAXA is Japan's version of NASA, and like the ESA, it has a large focus on science, tech, and commercial satellites, although their program is not capable of manned flight. Japan, a strong ally of the US, has ratified the Artemis Accords. Japan spent $4.9 billion on space programs in 2022, the third most behind the US and China. Speaking of which, as is the case in almost every domain, China has rapidly risen to the number two position in space, with almost 12 billion in space expenditures in 2022. 
The China National Space Administration has some incredible recent achievements, including launching its own space station, the Tiankong. A law passed in 2011 by the U.S. Congress, called the Wolf Amendment, prohibited NASA from working with China, thus prohibiting its space program from working with the International Space Station. This law has driven a deep wedge between the U.S. and Chinese blocs, in addition to the multitude of other issues between the two countries, and has also propelled the Chinese space program to new, but necessarily independent, heights. Roscosmos, the Russian space agency, has a long history of competition with the U.S. and a long history of global success, including the first satellite in space, Sputnik, and the first human in space, Yuri Gagarin. Roscosmos has continued to be a major player in space due to their deep history and experience. And despite the war in Ukraine, Russia continues to operate the ISS together with the U.S. and other partners. In fact, in September 2022, a U.S. astronaut flew with two Russian cosmonauts to the ISS, and just last month, Russia launched a rescue operation to save the same three people after a coolant leak caused by a micrometeor strike damaged the docked escape vehicle. A side note on names. Astronauts are from the U.S., cosmonauts are from Russia, and taikonauts may be a fake word, but they are Chinese astronauts. Yes, it's stupid that we use different names. Yes, we should all use the same name. And yes, of course, we should all just use the American name, of course. Lastly, India. India falls outside or in between the two major space faring blocks. Its space program, the Indian Space Research Agency, is probably the sixth best in the world behind the five we've mentioned here. It's had some impressive accomplishments, sending a probe to explore the moon in 20, uh, 2008 and another to explore Mars in 2014 called Mangalayan. Here is Shekman 16, quote, Despite ISRO's budget of about $1 billion, 5% of NASA's annual budget, the thrifty agency has unleashed a series of planetary accomplishments in recent years, end quote. Is it the absolute best space agency of course not. But does it do well for its size? Perhaps no country can compete with India in its space exploratory value per dollar. These are the major space agencies, certainly not the only ones. Next, let us touch on the space law that exists now even without Artemis. Despite being a set of short and uh, general guidelines, the Artemis Accords are the newest and most complete body of space law with any kind of international recognition. However, the space race of the 60s and 70s birthed a number of other laws that remain relevant today, most of which Artemis endorses. Let's touch on five of these UN-backed laws, all of which come up frequently in the evidence. First, the 1967 Outer Space Treaty. The main body of international and multinational law covering space uh, codified on the United Nations. 112 countries are parties to this treaty, including all major sp space faring nations. Its main purpose is to keep space peaceful and non-militarized. And importantly, this uh, Outer Space Treaty prohibits claiming sovereignty over objects in outer space. Next, the 1967 Rescue Agreement is an international agreement stating that Ratified states must make efforts to rescue personnel of any spacecraft that lands in their territory, whether because of an accident or distress or emergency or accidental landing. If someone comes from space, no matter what country they're from, and they land in your territory, go help them. Next, the 1972 Space Liability Convention is an international agreement stating that member countries are responsible for any spacecraft launched from their territory and can be held responsible for damages arising from them. For example, due to a satellite crashing in another nation. So if uh, your satellite is misguided, falls out of the sky and lands on my house, I can bring you to international court, I guess, and sue you for damages. Next, the 1974 Registration Convention is an international agreement stating that member states must give the UN details about the orbit of any space object for tracking purposes. This is a big part in trying to combat um, uh, space debris 
and just to make sure we kind of know what's up there, what's active, what's, what's, uh, what works, things like that. Next, the 1979 Moon Agreement. This one is a bit special. Uh, it's an international agreement stating, in essence, that control of celestial bodies, like the Moon, is turned over the, to the UN for the common heritage of mankind. Only 18 countries are party to this treaty, including zero nations that engage in human spaceflight. So this Moon Agreement is kind of seen as a failed agreement because no one actually going to space has signed on to it. Let's talk about the Artemis program. Uh, the Artemis program itself is a mission, again, spearheaded by NASA and now joined by other major groups like JAXA, the Canadian Space Agency, and ESA to establish a permanent base on the moon as a stepping off point for asteroid mining, Mars missions, and the great beyond. It's named for the twin sister of Apollo. Its current infrastructure includes the Space Launch System, NASA's current huge rocket for launching things into space, and the Orion space sh spacecraft, the uh, actual spaceship, eventually crewed, that will transport humans around the solar system. Another piece of infrastructure, the Lunar Gateway, is being planned, a moon-orbiting space station that will act as a base for robots and humans, and a relay station for communication and logistics. A human landing system is also being planned, a shuttle to relay people between the Lunar Gateway and the moon's surface. The Artemis program plans to return to the moon by 2025, although this specific year is increasingly unlikely as timelines get pushed back. And as per stated goals, Artemis plans to land the first woman and the first person of color on the moon. Why the focus on the moon, you might ask? After all, we've already landed men there several times. There are a few reasons that the moon makes sense. First, momentum. We haven't been to the moon in 60 years. The goal of getting back to the moon may be small, but it's what we need to jumpstart the exploration of greater outer space. Second, lessons. Establishing a permanent or semi-permanent base on the moon will teach us much about what's needed to do the same on Mars. We need to do something achievable before we can do something impossible. And third, resources. Leonard David, an award-winning space journalist, quotes Ian Crawford, a professor of planetary science and astrobiology, quote, a lot of metallic asteroids have pummeled the moon over the eons. Locating, woo, woo, woo. Locating those impactors could lead lunar prospectors to big yields of valuable platinum group elements. If going to the moon for scavenging polar volatiles, rare earth elements, then the impact sites of crashed asteroids could offer an added bonus, end quote. The moon may contain a great many resources that are rare on earth. But it also contains water, probably not a lot, but definitely some, uh, that can be used to sustain human life and uh, to produce rocket fuel to return uh, to Earth to explore the moon and at some point to continue exploration beyond the moon. So if we're going to do anything, if we're going to go anywhere, the moon is a great place to start. The Artemis Accords, the subject of today's resolution, are a set of guidelines that govern space exploration. They're pseudo-law agreements between the U.S. and other countries not emanating from the United Nations, but also not based on Earth. So who's to say the proper way to do these things? Although none of the principles are truly original, most are based in other U.N.-backed space law, they are a complete set of principles about space. So in this way, if the world can get behind them, they may truly be revolutionary. The chords are linked in the description below. There are just seven pages, so you should read them at some point, but for now, here are the key principles as interpreted by me. First, transparency. Space firing missions should be transparent about where they're going and what they're doing. Interoperability. Standards should be developed for space equipment so that everyone's gear, bases, and machines can work together. Emergency assistance. If any human in space is in need of assistance, they should be helped by whoever is nearby and available. Registration of objects. You should let the international community, in former law iterations, this was the UN, know about anything you launch into space. Uh, what is it? Where will it be traveling? What is it doing there? 
Number five, release of scientific data. Anything you learn in space should be shared with the international community. Let all of humanity benefit from your findings. Next, preserving outer space heritage. This is almost all about the US's Apollo landings on the moon. These Apollo landing sites should be preserved according to this principle. Uh, Neil Armstrong's footprints shouldn't be, you know, smudged by your robot. Seven, preventing harmful interference, especially no fight, essentially no fighting in space. Uh, keep a safe distance from other landing sites and rovers. Eight, safe disposal of space debris. Any craft, satellites, or other detritus should be properly disposed of. Uh, recycle it, take it back to Earth, shoot it into the sun, whatever, uh, so that the moon won't be clogged with debris like low Earth orbits are around the Earth currently. You might pause the video and guess which of these provisions might anyone argue with? They all seem pretty benign, even helpful, right? Jack Wright Nelson, a research associate at the National University of Singapore, breaks it down very nicely in a piece cut in the debate track brief. He says, in short, again, this is Nelson, that uh, those provisions that demarcate special territory in space are likely to be controversial. Uh, demand, for example, to protect heritage sites means that those sites are out of balance, de facto already claimed by the US. And the demand to prevent harmful interference by keeping safe distances, distances mean that wherever you land, you essentially claim automatically. If anyone gets near, you know, they're endangering your safety. Importantly, this all runs contrary to the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, which says that space and its resources should be for the common heritage of mankind, not to be claimed and exploited by whoever gets there first. So far, 23 countries and one territory have signed the accords. France joined recently, last June, so older evidence will keep pointing to the fact that, hey, well, France hasn't joined, but, well, they have now. And in December 2022, the first African countries, Rwanda and Nigeria, also ratified the accords. Importantly, if you want to participate in the Artemis program to go to the moon and beyond, uh, you have to ratify the Artemis Accords. They're a prerequisite for working with NASA's future. Kind of a big incentive. Okay, so as not to mingle arguments and meta arguments, let's first discuss what I predict will be the crux of many debates on this topic, at least uh, if you are not careful. AF argues that India should ratify the Artemis Accords. India should ratify the Artemis Accords if and only if it benefits India. So in a hypothetical world where India ratifying the Artemis Accords helped every country except India, uh, it helped the whole world, you know, but it hurt India. India still probably shouldn't ratify the accords. Um, unless you want to dive into some India as Christ philosophical framework, which you do not. Uh, here's the rub. India is already space partners with NASA. It's already defense buddies through the quad with three Artemis signatories. And Artemis already promises to share its insights and data. So what exactly would India gain by signing? The word of the day is uniqueness. Two things are important here. One, India needs Artemis. And two, Artemis needs India. First, India needs Artemis. AF can argue that India will at best be a second-rate space-firing nation without Artemis. But with Artemis, the country can benefit from technological, scientific, and economic gains, both in the short and the long term. With Artemis, India can be great. Without Artemis, India will be lucky to just get by. But most likely, India will be left in the dust behind many other alternatives. Uh, here's Mohandas 22, quote, It's essential that India be an early participant in the Artemis Accords so that it can gain lessons and experience from other countries that are members of the Accords. This could be things like robotics from Canada, sample return and avionics from Japan, and ground station and deep space network experience from the US and Australia. These technologies uniquely would be unavailable to India if it were not a member. Second, Artemis needs India. Again, Artemis represents an extraordinary powerhouse of space foreign nations without India. But India joining certainly pushes it over the edge of space law hegemony. Smith 21 says, quote, 
India would add a different layer of legitimacy to the accords that bringing other European nations on board would not. India's warmer relationships with Russia and China would also benefit the U.S. End quote. We'll see shortly what that means. But bringing either Russia or China on board, as absurd and impossible as that might seem, may in fact be a spark that ultimately brings humanity together as one. A type 1 civilization is possible here on Earth, although chances at the moment do seem slim. But getting India to ratify Artemis is one step closer to that impossible dream becoming a reality. Next, Neg. Neg argues that India should not ratify the Artemis Accords. We just talked a bit about uniqueness. It follows from this Neg should attack uniqueness, right? Uh, anything AF says can happen, Neg, Neg says that, yeah, can happen, but without the Artemis Accords as well. And much of the time, Neg will have a fantastic point here. Uh, always be pressing AF on uniqueness uh, if you're on Neg. But here's another deep flaw with Artemis. It's a bad plan, and it won't work. We'll talk about why in the next section, but as a starting point, India has many other options. From Neg's point of view, some or all of these alternatives may be better. First, they could try going alone. Again, India's space program is pretty impressive, especially given its budget. It's launched missions to Mars and the moon already, and cooperates with the US, Japan, Russia, and Europe on space things. By not signing onto a plan, it can continue working all angles without ostracizing uh, its many allies. Next, ILRS, China's uh, lunar research station, is a very competitive competitor to Artemis. India already has great space integrations with ILRS partner Russia, and although tensions are high with China now due to a border conflict, China may very well become, and in some areas already is, a peer competitor with the US. Clearly, India, sandwiched between China and Russia, has some decent geopolitical and logistical reasons to thaw relations with both countries. Uh, although India joining ILRS probably isn't on the table now, India should be keenly aware of the possible harm joining this competitor to ILRS could cause. Or, maybe best of all, a UN plan. India might push for a brand new multinational plan. The vacuum in space law should be filled by a uh, multilateral treaty. We'll come back to multilateralism several times in the next section, including reasons why it really should be preferred to bilateral and unilateral plans like Artemis and ILRS. Uh, going through the United Nations will make for safer, more sustainable, and more equitable space exploration. All right, just a few words on strategy. Of course, as always, an incomplete guide to strategy, but uh, some things I think are important. Let's go to AF. The Republic of India will make its mark on space. By joining the Artemis Accords, India will have a seat at the table in rulemaking on the newest frontier. Artemis brings standard law, safety, science, and peace to space, and India can help to strengthen these accords. By ratifying, India can uniquely secure technological advancements, economic gains, security assurances, and scientific advancements that would simply not be possible without ratifying Artemis. Now, our first set of arguments deal with the Artemis Accords and program themselves. First, law. Whether we like it or not, the new space age is upon us, spurred in large part by SpaceX and other private industry that has brought the ethos of the universe back to our attention. With private industry and governments around the world surging forward in satellite innovation, new rocket technologies, and even entirely new space stations like China, we need to establish ground rules, or space lane rules, for how we'll maintain peaceful and cooperative use of the final frontier. These rules have arrived with Artemis. Artemis builds on the 1967 space tree, along with another of other, a number of other widely accepted UN agreements to establish the standards that we all should follow. These rules are needed. The alternative to Artemis is no law at all, and that's not a good alternative. Now it is true, Artemis is a development of the United States, but Artemis doesn't preclude further discussion at the UN. Future UN treaties could be welcome as well. Uh, but COPUS, the Committee on the Use of Outer Space in the United Nations, 
is widely seen as paralyzed by its own rules and incapable of action, much like much of the UN. With Artemis, the US does what the UN simply cannot do. It makes space law. Here's Smith 21 again, quote, the US seeks to use the accords to build customary international law, which would bind not only parties to the accords, but also non-parties in their use and exploration of outer space, end quote. Even without signatories from China and Russia, in other words, establishing a basic set of customs for the use of outer space would incentivize all countries to fall in line. And as far as these customs promote safe, peaceful, and sustainable use of outer space, they should be welcomed and ratified by everyone, including India. Next, interoperability. Interoperability is the ability of equipment from any nation and any program to work well together. It's like standardizing USB-C uh, instead of a slew of proprietary phone chargers. It's the metric system, which works well for almost every country in the world. Imagine if every country had its own backwards way of measuring things in feet and inches. Uh, the world would be chaotic. The principle of interoperability is the basis that much of the Artemis Accords are built on. Rescue operations won't work if your equipment is incompatible. Registration won't work if you, uh, you're, if you track space debris, uh, debris and space object in different ways. The prevention of harmful interference is only possible when we have a set of standards so that we even know what harmful interference might look like. Anton Antonino Antonino Salmeri is a doctoral research in space law at the University of Luxembourg. He says that, quote, Section 5 has the potential to start a Copernican revolution in space exploration. The use of the expression interoperable common exploration infrastructure and standards seems to imply the possibility of developing and using internationally shared facilities for joint exploration activities. Following this logic, uh, instead of establishing multiple lunar bases, each with its own fundamental systems and infrastructures, landing, power, communication, and so on, the Artemis pa partners would integrate their, pro their different contributions to the program for the incremental development of a shared outpost, end quote. By failing to join Artemis, Indian engineers and scientists will be tempted to take shortcuts by designing non-interoperable systems while joining Artemis will keep the Indian space industry accountable to standards and let India reap the benefits of the new space race. Next, safety. Artemis also makes provisions for safety, both on the moon and in the cislunar space, the space between the Earth and the moon. This will become increasingly important as space gets more crowded. Here's Chow 23, quote, Creating sustainable and safe environment for cislunar operations will be critical. If humans intend to establish a permanent presence on the moon and venture beyond to Mars, it will be imperative to prioritize safety, sustainability, and transparency. End quote. On the moon itself, Article 11 of the Accords gives a few principles for ways to manage safety, but the main one revolves around safety zones. The Accords stipulate that signatory countries should provide notice of activity in space, including the location and nature of the activity, so that other countries can stay out of the area. For example, if you set up a moon base for core drilling, you might want other missions to keep a 10 kilometer distance from the site, for example, so as not to interfere with seismic measurements or risk accidental collisions. Again, by ratifying, India will give credibility to this crucial aspect of space law and confirm that India is dedicated to the long-term sustainability of space operations. Next, science. Artemis missions, like most space missions, have scientific discovery as a core goal. And given the size, scope, and future potential of these missions, India would necessarily lose out on the ability to advance its space science if it did not join. This, uh, ooh, Skiba 22 talks about this. So Artemis 1 flew last November, flying around the moon uh, uncrewed with no people. When it flew past the moon, it deposited 10 CubeSats, which are these cheap and tiny shoebox-sized satellites that have become wildly popular in recent years, um, onto the moon's surface and into moon orbit. Among them were experiments by U.S. companies, as well as by Italy and Japan, both Artemis signers. 
to study ice on the moon, improve maps of the moon surface. Uh, the moon surface area is pretty big, bigger than Africa's. Uh, study effects of radiation, snap photos, test new landing technology. Uh, the opportunity for break, groundbreaking science here cannot be overstated. And if India has ambitions to conduct space science on par with the rest of the world, it must ratify Artemis. Next, uh, our second set of arguments deal with the unique geopolitical relationships that India has uh, that makes joining Artemis a force multiplier on its current alliances and how alone India will not succeed in space. First, India can't do space alone. You'll remember the quote from Dr. Geary earlier calling India an echelon to space faring nation. In addition to poor funding, ISRO is simply poorly equipped. Its technology is old and obsolete, and most, almost all of its space development rests on technology transfers from Russia and the US. For those who point to India's successes in space, the fact is, almost 70 years after Sputnik, uh, humanity's first satellites, launching things into space is really a pretty old trick. Even tiny countries like the United Arab Emirates with no expertise and no experience launched a successful Mars mission, the Hope Probe, on their very first try. India's meager successes are, frankly, unimpressive. Without joining, India will be left behind in tech gains, scientific gains, and other spin-off benefits. India certainly cannot win or even compete in the space race alone. And if you can't beat them, you better join them. Forming a closer alliance with the US, especially in space, is a smart move. You'll recall that India's space budget is about 5% of NASA's. What's more, its, space, uh, its private space companies truly cannot hold a candle to the US's. Recall that the top 10 private space companies are all US companies. The US and India are already allies in defense, economics, and indeed already work closely together in space. Aditya Ramanathan is an associate fellow with the Takshashisha Institution. Together with some colleagues, he writes, quote, In recent years, cooperation has grown. India's Chandrayaan-1 moon mission carried two NASA payloads. ISRO and NASA are presently collaborating on the NASA ISRO Synthetic Aperture Radar, or NISAR, project. The two governments have also committed to cooperate on space situational awareness and discuss defense-related issues. End quote. Joining a U.S. alliance could have large technology and economic benefits to India. Again, signing the accords is a prerequisite for India's participating in the Artemis program. India should expect access to cutting-edge space technology, or by contrast, no access to this technology, based on its ratification of Artemis. Uh, Pradeep Mohandris, a research analyst at the Taksha, mm, it's pronounced Takshashila, not whatever I just said, at the Takshashila Institution, Bengaluru, quote, it's essential that India be, the, be an early participant in the Artemis Accords so that it can gain lessons and expertise from other countries that are members of the Accords. This could be things like robotics from Canada, sample returns and avionics from Japan, and uh, ground station and deep space network experience from the U.S. and Australia. I believe we already had that quote, but uh, it's a good one. So, India can gain tech by participating in Artemis, and it will not if it does not. Mohandras also says that, quote, By being a part of the Accords, India's space companies could become part of a global supply chain. This would also help attract investment capital towards Indian space startups and lead to flow of capital into India. And the space economy is growing. Segaloff 23, quote, the space industry is expected to grow to $1 trillion, uh, $1 trillion enterprise, up 10% each year, and to employ 20,000 people by 2030. Now, it's worth clearing the air on what the space economy actually means. When it comes to satellites, value can be provided fairly directly through GPS, mapping, uh, data links and other services to paying customers on Earth. When it comes to Artemis missions to the moon and beyond, there are no obvious ways to make money. Perhaps there are things to mine on the moon, or perhaps the moon can get us to asteroids, and 
perhaps asteroids have valuable things to mine, but any return on investment in bringing space resources back to Earth is far away, perhaps decades and trillions of dollars into the future. Shorter term gains like spin-off technologies to be used on Earth or space tourism are smaller ticket and less probable ways for companies and countries to turn a profit. In the meantime, these missions cost a lot of money, and that's what the space economy means for now. So if America needs $10 billion in rocket materials or a $50 billion lunar base, Indian suppliers and manufacturers can get on the supplier list by being part of the Accords. Chinese suppliers, the world's best at high-tech manufacturing, and Russia's, with its deep experience in all things space, are not on those lists for political reasons. But India has the unique opportunity to catch this windfall of space freedom. Officials from India and the U.S. have met on space issues as recently as January 31st of this year to discuss human space exploration, GPS, and policies for commercial space. The relationship is primed for the next level. India should ratify Artemis and ally itself with the world's number one power in space. Next, security. The Quad is a security alliance meant to counter China, composed of the US, Australia, Japan, and India. Three of these members have ratified Artemis. India is the odd one out. With all four countries on board, the Quad would have a solid set of rules for peaceful space behavior. Benjamin Silverstein, a research analyst for the space project at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, writes, quote, Bilateral agreements demonstrate Quad members demonstrate that they are be beginning to live up to their pledge, but the Quad must do more to achieve its lofty goals. The Quad need not reinvent the wheel in this endeavor. The U.S. developed Artemis Accords can serve as a ready-made starting point. The Artemis Accords represent more than just a lunar goal. The fundamental mission of the partnership is to reduce the chance that space activities incite conflict. This goal is congruent with the Quad's space priorities. End quote. Dr. Raji Rajagopalan, the director of CSST in New Delhi, agrees. Quote, Going forward, India should deepen its engagement with like-minded partners. In particular, it should push the Quad to double down on its efforts on space security and governance. End quote. Of course, Artemis is ostensibly all about peace. However, inasmuch as that is just lip service or a facade for other things, India should do all it can to solidify its relations with allies that it just might need. One sensible attack from Neg might deal with the other alternatives that India has to Artemis when it comes to space programs and space law, it's worth addressing in the AF section why these alternatives really are poor or impossible choices for India and for space exploration at large. First, ILRS. The first alternative is China's International Lunar Research Station. China has made incredible strides in military, science, tech, and nearly every competitive field imaginable. Russia, India's long-term space partner, is also party to the ILRS. Uh, it makes sense to at least consider this an option. Now, Roger Goplar, 22, says that, quote, India has no realistic alternative to the Artemis Accords. The International Lunar Research Station being developed by China and Russia is simply not a viable option for India, considering the state of India's relations with China, end quote. Edward Ramanathan at all 20 says that cooperation with China would be exactly counterproductive. It wouldn't just be worse than Artemis, it might be worse than doing nothing at all. Quote, The major role of China in the ILRS project could hamper or scuttle effective cooperation. As India's chief adversary, China would have, to incentive, have the incentive to delay or limit the benefits India receives from participation in the ILRS. There remains a possibility that proprietary Indian space technologies will be stolen or reverse engineered, end quote. India working with China on a mission to the moon is a, as politically absurd as the U.S. doing the same thing. In a perfect world, it seems ideal, but in the world we live in, there is really no chance. The other major 
theoretical alternative to Artemis would be the United Nations. After all, the Outer Space Treaty, uh, the major space law till now, came out through the UN. Why couldn't the next generation of space law also come through the UN? The fact is, the world, and especially the US, needs space law now, not later, and negotiating any major treaty with China and Russia's veto power in the current global political climate is out of the question. Here is Smith 21 again, quote, if the US were to wait for a standard UN style agreement to clarify things for Artemis missions, they'd be waiting a long time. The US would prefer to avoid negotiations about this issue with China or Russia, who will undoubtedly be looking for ways to hamstring the US domestic space industry. Thus, forging ahead with the Artemis program and the Artemis Accords allows the US to build accepted practice around space resource extraction and then leverage that emerging custom if and when the time comes to have these conversations uh, in a multilateral forum, end quote. In other words, if the world accepts Artemis, we have a place to start for future negotiations. But with nothing to start, the increasingly crowded space landscape may quickly become dangerous without a firm starting point. That's half. Here's Neg. The Republic of India should not ratify Artemis. The Accords will perpetuate a divisive, hegemonic, and dangerous colonialism of space. The Accords will divide the world into two blocks, deepening the new Cold War at a time when humanity most needs to come together. The existence of other approaches, like the ambiguous approach that has served India's interests for so long, or a multilateral approach that will serve all of humanity the most, shows that ratifying Artemis is simply the wrong move. First, U.S. centrism. Artemis is a singularly U.S.-centric proposition. It's proposed by the U.S. at a time when the U.S. needs it, according to U.S. desires, and without input from the international community. Making the Accords a precondition for cooperation in Artis Artemis missions solidifies the fact that this isn't a set of laws for the world to live by. Instead, it's a set of laws for the U.S. to benefit from. The U.S. has been the global hegemon for 70 years. Although its relative power is decreasing, it's still the number one country in nearly every way that counts. And to hold on to this power, even beyond the limits of our globe, is using Artemis to take a U.S.-centered approach to outer space. Chug 21 says of the Accords, quote, The fact that they were drafted primarily by NASA in collaboration with the U.S. Department of State does speak to U.S. hegemony over the whole matter and space laws at large. If history is any evidence, U.S.'s dominance, as benevolently, benevolently hidden as it might be, finds its way out eventually, often at the cost of other expendable nations. Concern has been expressed over the fact that the treaty makes the U.S. a licensing nation for commercial space companies, and in turn a gatekeeper to the moon and other celestial bodies. While the Outer Space Treaty establishes that no one can lay claim to the other worlds, NASA has made it clear that countries and companies can own and use resources that are derived from the moon. This has incited objections against the motives behind the accord and their potential consequences. Artemis is about the U.S. It's not about India. It's not about the world. Grush 22 talks about how Artemis runs contrary to the Outer Space Treaty, allowing countries to de facto claim territory in space on arrival. Quote, when the Artemis Accords were first presented, one major critique revolved around the use of lunar resources, with some arguing that Accords were an American land grab in space. The concept of utilizing space resources as, is seen by some as conflicting with the Outer Space Treaty's instructions not to claim sovereignty of a celestial object, end quote. India has an experience of colonialism in sheer numbers unlike any other. At least 100 million Indians died under and because of British colonialism. Many of these were deaths of famine, similar to some of the other great mass killings of the 20th century. Look up Sullivan and Hikla's Al Jazeera piece for the awful details. Of all others, India should be cautious about supporting a set of policy that continue to promote colonialism, even if that colonialism happens to be in space. Both Russia and China, the second and third biggest space nations, won't join Artemis. The U.S. knows that, 
And by unilaterally creating a set of space rules, it necessarily means the creation of two systems. Russia has announced that it plans to pull out of the ISS in favor of building its own space station. And the war in Ukraine has, of course, brought U.S.-Russia relations to their lowest point since the Soviet era. Russia, furthermore, agrees with the colonialist take of Artemis. Here's Fiddler 20, quote, Roscosmos, the Russian space agency, compared the U.S. stance to colonialism in claiming for the U.S. the right to seize territories and resources in space. Similarly, Russian officials expressed unease about the Artemis Accords and their compatibility with international law, with the Roscosmos director asserting that the principle of invasion is the same, whether it be the moon or a rock. End quote. Unlike Russia, China hasn't been allowed to participate in U.S. space projects, including the ISS, since 2011, when the Congressional Wolf Amendment barred NASA from working with China's space agency. I don't need to detail for you how dicey the U.S.-China relationship is now, but unsurprisingly, they are also not a fan of Artemis. G et al. 20, and here they're quoting Song Zhongping, a Chinese military and aerospace space command, uh, commentator, quote, The U.S. is developing a new space version of an, an enclosure movement in pursuit of colonization and claiming sovereignty over the moon, Song told the Global Times, criticizing the Cold War mentality of the U.S., as it sought to outcompete China and Russia in outer space. Observers called the Artemis Accord an unembellished and preposterous attempt to unilaterally set ground rules for lunar resource exploitation. By excluding Russia and China, the Accords would encourage irresponsible use of lunar resources and instigate conflicts over lunar sovereignty. End quote. By signing onto the Accords, India would signal to China, its neighbor, and to Russia, its economic, military, and political ally, that it's going in another direction. Joining China and Russia's major geopolitical rival is not likely to make relations any warmer. Next, rich poor gap. One of the obvious impacts of space colonialism is perpetuating the rich poor gap on Earth and even making it worse. Artemis will help rich countries to garner the benefits of space exploration while leaving poor countries behind. Space reporter Lauren Grush quotes Gabriel Swinley of Harvard Law School, who says, in talking about France's apprehensions of Artemis, quote, Space resources is something that the international community needs to really spend some time and think about, so that it doesn't become either a Wild West gold rush situation, or that it doesn't just replicate some of the same inequalities that we see on Earth, end quote. Rosanna de Plano professor and co-director of the Center for European Law and Internationalization, gives details about how this will work and how it conflicts with extant law. And quote, uh, <laughs> quote, begin quote, richer nations stand to gain the most from access to space, with a growing international agreement allowing them to lawfully mine the moon and other objects in space in support of scientific missions. The Artemis plan envisions the use of space resources. For example, mining the rocks and soil of the moon for oxygen and hydrogen. The Artemis Accords support the use of space resources on a first-come, first-served basis. As a result, states with the financial and technological means to get there first will gain the most. Less developed or emerging space states will not profit from space resource utilization." End quote. There's a reason the U.S. hasn't signed the Moon Treaty, which talks about the common heritage of mankind. The U.S. has no interest in this heritage but only of projecting hegemony into space. The previous section may have been a little bit philosophical. Now let's turn our attention to more practical harms that Artemis is sure to cause. These harms stem mostly from the unilateral nature of Artemis. Without a common set of laws for the US, Russia, China, and the rest of the world, only some countries will be following these standards. China and Russia are likely to develop their own standards and get other countries on board with them. This splintering of the international order creates chaos and plenty of room for conflict. First, on extraction. Artemis paves the way for resource extraction and with provisions like safety zones attempts to make this process safe. However, in practice, the splintered international system that Artemis creates is likely to create instability and conflict over these resources. Dr. Susmita Mohani is an Indian spaceship designer and entrepreneur. She says of the Accords, quote, 
If the history on our home planet is anything to go by, commercial space resource mining can neither lead to a peaceful nor environmentally sustainable presence on the moon. It would therefore be unwise to view this agreement as a benign instrument to facilitate cooperation between friendly nations for sustainable exploration of outer space, despite assurances made to that effect. End quote. India should not sign on to an accord that guarantees fights over space stuff. Conflict over extraction rights, however, is only one component of the stage being set for conflict in space in general. Dennis O'Brien, founder of the Space Treaty Project, draws a parallel between Artemis and colonial patterns that gave rise to humanity's most brutal wars. There are several parallels. First, there were first movers. Spain and Portugal in the past, America now, that wish to lay claims to new worlds. Second, they need external validation in a way that appears legitimate, but actually isn't. In the past, this was a blessing from the Pope, and now it is the Artemis Accords. Third, these ex exclusive rights and lacked, lack of equal representation didn't sit well with other countries. In the past, the Northern European countries, and now Russia and China. Here's a quote. The dominance model set up centuries of conflict among the major powers in Europe. Militant nationalism and economic colonialism became the principles guiding national policy. The result was centuries of war, suffering, and neglect among the major powers. End quote. He goes on to say that past colonial patterns of violence will reemerge thanks to Artemis. Quote, the U.S. has specifically stated its intentions to extract material from the moon without any international agreement. The newly announced Artemis Accords go even further. There will also be safety zones to avoid harmful interference with such operations. The effect is to establish exclusive economic zones, especially if a harmful interference is defined to include economic harm, not just safety. Will the new Space Force be used to protect such economic interests? Will other nations be excluded if they support the Moon Treaty? This is the slippery slope of using inter uh, unilateral action to establish economic right rather than an international agreement. End quote. If unilateral decrees are likely to cause conflict, the obvious solution is something multilateral. Notwithstanding the abuse and genocide of native peoples, the extreme violence of the last several hundred years in Europe may have been avoided if the Portuguese and Spanish, a step above other countries in sailing technology, much as the U.S. is a step above other countries now in space technology, had not been so eager to claim the new world for themselves. Rahul Charge, uh, Chaudhry, a researcher at the United States Study Center, says that only pluralism can prevent conflict in space. Quote, U.S. dominance and the threat of a quasi-legal structure have turned many away, making it ineffective to uphold space law and prevent militaristic conflict. Military conflict in space may seem like a concept taken straight out of a sci-fi movie, yet it represents a potential future for the international community if a unanimously codified treaty is not implemented. Resource competition in space and space mining is likely to become the most important point of global contention in the near term. While the Artemis Accords represent a new opportunity to rewrite and update the rules of space from the Outer Space Treaty, it is essential that they are rules all countries can agree on. A more pluralistic treaty is the only way to ensure peaceful cooperation in space and pacify the self-interested inclinations that come with resource competition." End quote. So, the question remains for India. Should their weight be thrown behind a plan to ensure that space remains the common heritage of mankind? Or should they endorse a unilateral push to lay the American flag in space and ensure that conflicts of Earth are carried out to the stars? Next, space debris. Without an international system, space debris will continue to be a vexing issue. Continue uh, to crowd out low Earth orbit with pieces of metal going at incredible speeds that can pierce a spaceship, rip apart a satellite, uh, leaving many orbits inaccessible to spacecraft and satellites. This is particularly true in the theoretical but very possible case of the Kessler effect, where one satellite explosion due to a collision uh, creates a cloud of shrapnel that in turn breaks apart more space objects, quickly leaving space services offline. How would our world change if GPS disappeared in a single chaotic day? Only a multilateral set of rules can hope to solve space debris. And while the Artemis Accords addresses the issue, the US-centric set of principles won't stop it. Here is Silverstein 22, quote, 
The trend towards an individualist state approach in the exploration of outer space and the movement away from collectivism and multilateralism has also left a void in governance and accountability, which risks compromising the long-term safety and sustainability of outer space activities. This is particular, particularly apparent in relation to the vexed issue of space debris. With plans like Artemis, we're sure to bring these trash-spewing habits to the moon as well. Mohanty 22, quote, if we refuse to act, we will wreck the moon much the same way we have wrecked low Earth orbit with millions of man-made debris objects due to the absence of far-sighted laws, end quote. As a space-faring nation, and indeed as a nation of Earth, India has a vested interest in preventing and eliminating space debris. Signing onto the Artemis Accords will help ensure, however, that this issue is never solved. If, by the way, you want to run some kind of space debris argument, which I think will be pretty common, uh, there was, I believe just yesterday, a release from uh, NASA, I believe, that uh, a Russian satellite, perhaps with some like ASAT capabilities, exploded yesterday, leaving I think, five, some 500-ish new pieces of space debris in space. So things are heating up. Next, competition. The Artemis Accords are a set of laws for space, but a set uh, tied closely to the Artemis program. Insofar as the Artemis program is bad, signing on to the Artemis Accords is throwing support into a program spearheaded by NASA with no competition. And competition is good, especially when your program is bad. First, the Artemis program faces a great many probably unsolved challenges. NASA's Office of Inspector General surveyed the program in 2021 and released, released a truly damning report of the state of affairs. Quote, The Artemis program faces schedule, procurement, technical, and funding risks. SLS and Orion have also experienced technical challenges in later development phases. Additionally, the Gateway and HLS program received significantly less funding than required to meet NASA's initial acquisition strategy. End quote. We should give NASA brownie points for being transparent about how much they're failing, but we can't really give them brownie points for anything else. So that's one thing. The program has a lot of issues with it. Second, the technological plan to get us to the moon isn't the best. Again, the plan is to launch humans off of Earth in a spaceship, deliver them to an orbiting lunar space station, transfer them to a module to go down to the surface, and then house them in separate bases. If this seems kind of complicated to you. Uh, you're in good company. Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon, thinks it's absurd. Instead, he supports the moon direct plane detailed and popularized by aerospace engineer and author Robert Zubrin. The plan shows that it's possible to create cheaper, more efficient, and less complicated missions to the moon. Although Zubrin's paper isn't a direct argument for or against this topic, Zubrin's paper was probably the best I read in any of the research I've done on this topic. I've linked it in the description and recommend it for anyone who both finds space fascinating and wants to crush your affirmative opposition. Of course, NASA's behemoth bureaucracy is already locked into its Artemis programs. Even simple changes like substituting reusable SpaceX rockets for NASA's space launch system would make too many people lose too much face for it ever to become reality. The bureaucratic nature of NASA just makes it inefficient hard to change. Signing onto Artemis is signing onto poor technology and a string of future failures. India has no choice but to let America run its foolish space missions, but it does have a choice of whether to become a fool itself. Lastly, I'd like to make a brief case for each of three possible alternatives to Artemis. China's ILRS, a multilateral UN plan, or remain, uh, remaining out of both and embracing India's great geopolitical strength, its strategic ambiguity. First, ILRS. China's statement with the ILRS, one of only two operational space stations, is that China is on the space map, able to do launch and maintain maintenance of a te technology at least as well as the US. But it's a bit more than that. Again, as per the 2011 Wolf Amendment, NASA is not allowed to work with China's space agency, the CNSA. Chinese taikonauts aren't welcome on board the ISS, nor will they be invited to Artemis programs or the Artemis Accords. A critique of a Chinese alternative 
to the Artemis Accords might be to blame China. If they sign Artemis, then we're well on our way to an international system. But the fact is, it's the US that refuses to cooperate with China. And China really has no other choice but to go its own path. Instead, China partners most closely with Russia and European space agencies. Russia is India's largest space partner and one of its closest allies, and has good relations with much of Europe. A partnership on the ILRS or related projects may therefore be a better strategic move for India at some point. Joining the ILRS may not be a viable option for India now, given its frosty relations with China, but by the same token, joining Artemis might preclude it from Chinese missions and programs involving Russia. India must carefully consider how to balance its geopolitical interests, and signing on to Ar Artemis might mean giving up future opportunities with other major players in space. As we've seen time and time again throughout this presentation, a UN-backed multilateral scheme is what everyone really wants for space. It's really the only thing that will work. This is indeed the major critique of Artemis. To bring the point home, here's Newman 20, quote, the U.S. promotion of the accords outside of the normal channels of international space law, such as the U.N. Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, will be a cause of consternation. By requiring potential collaborators to sign bilateral agreements on behavior instead, some nations will see the U.S. as trying to impose their own quasi-legal rules." End quote. India should push for a multilateral solution, avoiding the many harms we've detailed in this section and seeking a future in space that benefits us all. Let's end this section, end this lecture, with this. India is doing exactly what it should in the status quo. Remaining uh, neutral, maintaining its delicate ba political balance between Russia, China, Europe, and the US, cooperating with all where possible, but keeping its options open as well. Rohera 22 lays out India's unique strengths. Quote, India's historic position of strategic autonomy in its foreign policy is also reflected in space diplomacy on the international stage. India is one of the few countries with a robust space program that has not signed the U.S. Artemis Accords. India does cooperate on a range of civil and military space activities uh, with the Quad, allowing it to maintain its national security priorities in space. India's strategic ambiguity might allow it to leverage its position to bring outer space par powers to the negotiating table. India should commit to creating international space laws to prevent unilateral norm building and also irresponsible behavior in outer space." End quote. India, in other words, is in a unique position to influence the space powers of the world toward an outcome that will work for all countries and all people, not just the U.S. and those intimidated and coerced into joining Artemis. India should remain neutral as it seeks a multilateral solution that will work well for everyone. And it can do this while keeping its space security and international friendships intact. That has been your debate track lecture. I have been Joel. You have been beautiful. Thanks again for watching. Good luck with this topic and have fun out there, kid. Till next time.